Um, hello, everyone. Thank you very much. Um, before to start, um, I would like to thank uh, the organizing committee for uh, inviting me uh, to this training session. It's really a great honor to be part of this important, important workshop uh, trainings on new guidelines or old guidelines since you are now uh, a new member of ICH. It's, it's normal that you, you need to adopt those guidelines and trainings are required, so, and I feel really honored to be part of this training. Um, uh, you can see here the disclaimer. Um, um, my presentation is an adaptation of uh, the presentation given by Dr. Bridget Brake from uh, Bee Farm in 2011 uh, with the incorporation of how can I experience with the use of ICH Q6B. So you will notice that um, since my, the previous speaker and I, we uh, sh have the same content, we have some uh, similar slides, and I apologize for that. Uh, I will go quickly when I see that, you know, uh, it's uh, the same uh, slides. So uh, before to start, uh, I was thinking that since ICHQ6B is uh, related to the uh, setting of spec for biotech product that I would give you like a brief uh, outline of the uh, organization Health Canada and who is involved in the regula regulation of biotherapeutic product because like uh, MFDS and PMDA, Health Canada is a big department and there are like uh, several branches involved in the review of several products and uh, the, uh, the branch that is in charge of regulating our drugs is the health product and food branch, the one in red. Um, within uh, the health product and food branch, uh, TPD um, here is in charge of regulating the small molecules. Uh, B BGTD here uh, is in charge of regulating all biologics and radio pharmaceuticals uh, in Canada. And that's the organization I belong to. Um, and within BGTD, uh, the center of evalu for the evaluation of radio pharmaceuticals and biologics is in charge of regulating all the biotherapeutic bio products that include cytokines, hormones and enzyme, monoclonal antibodies, and I belong to the monoclonal antibodies uh, divisions. Um, Health Canada is a member, or uh, is part, I have a long, has a long history uh, with uh, ICH. And uh, I thought that I would give you just a brief overview of the involvement of Health Canada um, with ICH. Uh, from the beginning, Health Canada has been an observer uh, uh, starting in 1990. Um, this, um, they had an active participation uh, throughout the years, even as an observer, and uh, they made the commitments to implement all ICH guidelines. Uh, Health Canada became a standing member in October 2015 and it was recognized as a standing member in the Articles of Associations. And uh, based on this, we have the similar rights as the founding members. And um, with this status, we uh, automatically participate on the ICH Management Committee. And as all members, uh, we have the obligation to implement the ICH guidelines. Um, the current participation at ICH from Health Canada, um, uh, we have representation on the ICH Assembly and, uh, um, and the Management Committee. We have expert participating in about 80% of the working groups. We have two more, I have two more colleagues here today uh, that will talk on different topic, one on Q5A and another one on the safety topics. They're both on the ex ICH expert working groups. So we have rep on about 80% of our working groups. 
but as you know, uh, ICH has grown significantly, um, and can and so we cannot really participate in on every working groups. So uh, the approach that we use is that we develop a collaboration uh, with the on ICH guideline with the. Uh, a different partner to share information, the ACSS. ACSS stands for Australia, Canada, Singapore, and uh, Switzerland. And there are, as you may know, some challenges with the development and impl implementation of ICH guideline. The first one is that it aims for harmonization in every region. And this is really hard to get a consensus when you uh, consult and uh, work with all regions. Um, Sometimes to adopt the guidelines, you need to make regulatory changes because uh, the process you have in place or the guidelines you have in place or the regs currently in place are not aligned with the new ICH uh, guidelines. So that's a challenge. We need to make regulatory amendments. Sometimes we need to adapt uh, the, the current policy guidelines and operations to make sure that we comply with the ICH guidelines. Sometimes, like here today, uh, we need trainings when uh, we have no rep on the working groups and that we need to implement the guidelines. So uh, we also need uh, trainings and um, another challenge is uh, the harmonized interpretation post-implementation. And here interpretation is, is important because the way ICH guidelines are written, they are written in English and there are some nuances sometimes and some countries, they, they translate the guidelines in their own language and, and you may lose those nuances so there might be uh, um, sometimes different interpretation uh, post implementation. So going back to ICH Q6B, uh, it was released uh, in 1999. It was adopted by High Canada in 2001 and uh, became effective uh, the same date in 2001. So this is uh, the outline of my presentations. So uh, it really, uh, I did like the previous speaker and uh, so I provided an overview of ICHQ6B and after that I uh, provided the Health Canada feedback and experience using Q6B. What are the common issues? So I might focus a bit more on those uh, slides. So, uh, the scope of ICH Q6B, right? it talks about biotech products, but really it talks about, it applies to all proteins and uh, polypeptides. Uh, their derivative products and uh, which are components like the conjugates. So if you have an antibody drug conjugates, Q6B uh, will apply. Uh, it, they may be produced from recombinant or non-recombinant cell culture expression systems and can be highly purified and characterized. And this is important. We talk about well-characterized product uh, using appropriate set of uh, methods. And uh, so the principle of Q6B may also apply to other product types such as proteins, polypeptide, uh, isolated from tissue and body fluid. Uh, here there's a, a note, it's, uh, it's Q6B states that it doesn't cover antibiotics, synthetic peptides, and polypeptides, uh, appearance vitamins, cell metabolite, DNA product, allergenic extract, or conventional vaccines, cells, whole blood, and cellular blood components. Um, this, uh, th there was a slide from the previous speaker about, uh, com about this comparing the small molecules and biologics because QCSV is really about biologics, biotech product. And, and this is a slide to show uh, the a comparison in terms of size and complexity. Like how can we compare uh, a small molecule to uh, a biologics? Uh, so if you consider like the aspirin, which has only 21 atoms, uh, 
the human growth hormone may have 3,000 atoms and uh, an antibody 25,000 uh, atoms. In terms of complexity, so if an aspirin can be compared to a bike, uh, a large molecule like a growth hormone could be compared to a car and an antibody could be compared to a business jet. Just to give you um, uh, an, uh, an example of how biogics uh, are much more complex and harder to characterize than small molecules. And what makes the, the biologics uh, more variable? So there are like different reasons why it's much more complex and hard to characterize. Uh, it's because the raw materials that are used to manufacture bi the biologics are variable in nature. Like when they use serum, you never have, like from batch to batch, you never have the same serum, there's variation. Same for the enzyme, cell substrates. Uh, the manufacturing process are biological in nature and variable, so we talk about cell culture process. Uh, we cannot sterilize or terminally sterilize the product, although it will kill the proteins. So you need to do to have aseptic processing. Uh, there is it's due to the nature of the complex structure of the final product, uh, molecular weight and structure are poorly defined. Um, and uh, in general, biologics are sensitive to temperature, freestyle light, so you need really to control that. Uh, it's also the test. The tests that are used to uh, characterize batches of the product are variables in nature. Just think about bioassays. They're like the, normally the acceptance range are wide. Um, uh, the, and the quality cannot be established entirely by test on the material in the final container. Uh, some impurities, they're so diluted at the drug product stage that you cannot test on the drug product, you have to test on the drug substance. Uh, so, um, so you cannot just rely on uh, the drug product to uh, show quality. So this leads to the paradigm, the current paradigm about the biotech product is that the process is uh, the product. Uh, this means that the entire, entire manufacturing process determines the quality of a biotech medicinal products. Um, it depends on the quality of uh, the raw materials and uh, also on the consistency of the manufacturing process when we think about fermentation, purification, formulation, filling. Uh, sponsor, they need to demonstrate uh, consistency and uh, like the, 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 the entire manufacturing process should be described and uh, controlled in details. And uh, considering the variability of those processes, like minor changes may affect uh, the quality, safety, and efficacy of uh, uh, biologics. The next slide, this is just to give you some example of type of biologics that are uh, currently on the market. Here is uh, the uh, definition of a spec uh, in ICHQCSB, it's exactly the same slide as, as my colleagues. Uh, so uh, I, I don't want to repeat it, but the key points here, um, it's a legally binding criteria. It's a set of criteria, several tests are listed, and when it's approved by the regulatory agency, you need to comply with those spec if you want to, uh, if you want to release your product. And it, it provides assurance that the quality is safe and efficacious over uh, its shelf life, shelf life. And what conformance to specification means? It means that the drug substance and drug product when tested according to the listed tests will meet uh, the acceptance criteria. So that's what we are looking for. Um, general concept of uh, specifications. Uh, we mentioned in, in the previous talk that you know the spec is only one aspect of the total control strategies. 
there, there, there are like other critical uh, parts. Uh, first is uh, the total product characterization during development upon which many of the spec are based. Uh, adherence to uh, good to GMP is another uh, key aspect. Uh, the process must be validated. You need to be able to control your raw material and uh, in processing and have IPC testing in place. And uh, also you need to account for uh, the result from the stability testings. So the spec are chosen to confirm the quality of the drug substance and drug product instead of establishing full characterization and it should focus on those molecular and biological characteristics found to be useful in ensuring the safety and efficacy of the product. Uh, the next slide is mainly like a, uh, an illustration of the spec as part of the overall uh, control strategy. At uh, the spec, they are linked to the manufacturing process, linked to the preclinical data and clinical studies. They are, they are also linked to the uh, analytical methods and they have to account for uh, the, the stability uh, studies, the stability data of the drug substance and drug product to ensure they will have the quality uh, required uh, uh, to support the safety and efficacy as shown uh, in the clinical studies. So we, uh, in the previous presentation, we, uh, I, uh, we, we talked a lot about uh, the concept of uh, heterogeneity. And um, so, and this is really uh, a key point. Um, so the spec are product specific and uh, when we talk about uh, biotech product, we need to take into account the variability of the product and that's what we just said. Uh, the, the desired product is not only one product, but it's a mixture. When you have, what you have in the vial at the end, it's a mixture of ant anticipated post-translational modified forms. For example, you may have several glycoforms. Uh, in fact, an uh, inherent degree of structural heterogeneity occurs in proteins due to the biosynthetic process used by living organisms uh, to produce the product. And the, uh, the, the variability of the recombinant product may originate from the fermentation process, the downstream process, or during storage. Uh, what is really important is that the manufacturer should define the pattern of heterogeneity of the desired product and demonstrate consistency with that, uh, uh, with that of the lot used in the preclinical and clinical studies. And this is what, as a regulator, we really look at because when they develop their early batches for preclinical and clinical data, they have, you know, data, they have safety data, some efficacy data, but when they move to their commercial process, they must be able to bridge those data. So they need to demonstrate consistency in terms of uh, a pattern of heterogeneity. Uh, and since uh, the, the heterogeneity of this product defines the quality, the degree, the degree and profile of this heterogeneity should be characterized to show a lot to lot consistency, that's what I was saying. And when these variants of the desired product have properties comparable to those of the desired product, uh, they are considered process related substance. And when the activity is different, they are considered process uh, product related uh, impurities. So uh, when we talk about heterogeneity, one of the main quality attributes su subject to variation is the oligosaccharide structure. Uh, like we have a pool of variable structures, but what the manufacturer need to do is really to define the range of variability concerning the, uh, all those glycoforms and what's the impact on the safety and efficacy and, and the next slide is an example of uh, the impact of uh, glycosylation of monoclonal antibodies. Uh, for example, the mannose uh, may link to, uh, may bind to the ligand 
for mantle binding proteins and uh, activate the complement activation. Um, sialic acid may uh, have an act suppress the ADCC activity, or again, um, or the absence of core fucals will have uh, will increase the ADCC activity. So that just to show you that uh, you need to characterize those glycoforms, set acceptance criteria, and uh, and make sure that from lot to lot you have consistent product. So th again, this is just to say that it is really important to uh, define the pattern of uh, heterogeneity. And those studies are part of the characterization studies uh, necessary, to, necessary to establish the relevant spec. And, and so the characterization studies uh, are, are there to the provide a comprehensive understanding of the chemical structure, physical properties, and uh, biological properties, impurity profile, and degradation pathway of the drug substance. Uh, they, they also serve as a guide in selecting spec assays and stability indicating assays. And um, they, they are used to determine the effect of process change on the drug substance. So that's how you get product understanding. So um, as mentioned in the previous talk, uh, this is the list of, uh, of properties that should be assessed as part of the characterization studies, uh, the chemical structure, physical chemical properties, biological activity, purity, impurities and quantity, and I will go over each uh, of them quickly. Uh, for example, if we take uh, uh, monoclonal antibodies uh, in terms of physical chemical characteristics, uh, what's, what's the characteristic of the variable region? Do you have any deamidation, oxidation, glycation uh, for on, on the constant region? Do you have any, again, deamidation, oxidation? You need to uh, understand and characterize those uh, properties. In terms of biological characteristics, do you, do you have any binding activity, effector functions, uh, any other biological properties? That's what you need to, uh, to define uh, with the use of the character, uh, characterization studies. Um, in terms of uh, physical chemical uh, properties, uh, it consists in the determination of the composition, physical properties, and uh, primary structure of the desired product. And uh, in some cases, uh, information regarding higher order structure of the desired product may be obtained by uh, appropriate uh, uh, physical chemical uh, methodologies. And, and, and this slide is the same as the one presented before, just to say that in terms of biological activity, you may have uh, different assays, you may validate different assays. Uh, you have the cell culture based bioassay. You have uh, bioassays, binding assays, or animal based biological assays. And uh, they all measure different response. Uh, and here it's an, an example of specifications, acceptance criteria that we see uh, for each type of assays. As you can see, the animal based assays are. Uh, normally a bit more valuable, even if we see less and less uh, animal-based assay because uh, of the three R uh, to reduce, replace uh, the, the, uh, the animals by cell, um, by cell line or other tests. And uh, this is a statement in uh, ICHQ6B it says that for complex molecules, the physical chemical information may be extensive, but unable to confirm the higher order structure, which, however, can be inferred from the biological activity. And this we see that uh, uh, frequently. In such cases, a biological assay with wider confidence limit may be acceptable when combined with a specific uh, quantity measure. Uh, this has been also covered previously. If you have an antibody, that's your desired product, that's what you have. 
uh, you need to characterize the immunochemical properties. Uh, it should be fully characterized. You should um, a binding assay of the antibody for purified antigens and a uh, defined region of antigen, antigen should be uh, developed. Uh, you should determine the affinity and immunoreactivity, including the cross-reactivity of uh, your antibody. And the target molecule bearing the relevant epitope should be biochemically defined and the epitope itself defined when uh, possible. So uh, the immunochemical properties may serve to identify the protein or epitope of protein, hom homogeneity or purity or uh, quantifications. And if this is part of the lot release criteria, uh, all relevant information pertaining to the antibody should be made available. In terms of uh, purity, so um, it's the determination of absolute as well as relative purity are highly method dependent. Um, and that's why we use several methods most of the time. Um, and yeah, consequently, the purity of the drug substance and drug product is assessed by a combination of methods. Heterogeneity needs to be considered. And for the purpose of flood release, an appropriate subset of methods should be selected and justified uh, for determination of uh, purity. Another important element of uh, the characterization is uh, the uh, impurities. Uh, you may have process-related impurities and product-related impurities. Um, Sometimes those impurities are really, really uh, in small quantity. It's impossible to, uh, to uh, characterize, but for product-related impurities, if you can generate enough, uh, you should try to characterize those products to the extent possible and evaluate the biological activities associated with those uh, uh, product-related uh, pro uh, variants. Process-related uh, impurities, we are, we are all, all, all aware. It's, um, it may be derived from cell substrate, so it consists of whole cell proteins, uh, whole cell DNA, it may come from the cell culture, like uh, inducer antibiotics or media components. Uh, it may come from the downstream process, uh, processing, uh, so the reagents or uh, colon leachables. Product related impurities include aggregates, fragments, and clip form. Uh, and uh, contaminants include viruses, bacteria, and uh, fungi. Uh, this is a, a list of process-related impurities. And uh, here are example of uh, what is considered product-related impurities and modification. Um, so in terms of product-related impurities, you may have truncated, clipped, cleaved form. You may uh, have aggregates, dimer, multimer, dissociation or isomerization. In terms of modification, you may have acetylation, acetylation, uh, oxidation, and glycation. So all that, you need to monitor that when you do your characterization studies and, and also uh, evaluate the activities of those uh, variants. And after, with this assessment, that will help you to define, so is it really a product related impurities or a product rated substance. A product rated substance is a modified product, like a glycated product, but with the same or similar activity. So in that case, you don't really need to control it because it doesn't have like a, an adverse uh, effect uh, or on the safety of your product or on the efficacy. But if um, the molecular variants of the desired product um, do not have uh, the same properties or comparable pro properties with the desired product uh, with respect to activities, efficacy, and safety. In that case, they are considered process related, uh, product related impurities, and you should have control in place 
to uh, minimize uh, their levels. So that's, um, that's exactly what I just mentioned. Um, so here are some examples of specification that we commonly see the for um, product created impurities. For example, for aggregates, uh, we see like, no, like the monomer should be higher than 95% or aggregates, fragments less than 5%. Uh, this is by size exclusion. HPLC by SDS page, uh, we can see no new band more higher than the BSA control. Oxidized form by reverse phase, we can see no more than 10, 15%. So, but all those are product specific. You really need to characterize your product, isolate those variants, determine the activity, and based on that, uh, you uh, set your uh, specifications. Um, contaminants are also part of the characterization studies. There, it includes all advent adventitiously introduced materials not intended to be part of the manufacturing process, such as chemical and biochemical materials. Uh, for example, microbial protease or uh, microbial species. And of course, uh, contaminants should be strictly avoided and or stably controlled with appropriate in process acceptance criteria or action limit for drug substance or drug product specifications. And when we refer to adventitious viral or mycoplasma contamination, uh, the con concept of action limit is not applicable. So we expect to see an, an, uh, so a negative result as uh, the action limit or the, as the acceptance criteria. So, and, and the last aspect of uh, characterization is uh, the quantity. Uh, it's normally uh, a measure of the protein content. It's uh, really critical for biotech uh, product. Um, and, but in some cases, it may be demonstrated that the Quantity values obtained may be directly related to those found using the biological assay. If you can establish uh, that correlation between those two parameters, it may be appropriate to use a measurement of quantity rather than the measurement of biological activity in the manufacturing process, such as filling by mass, because the assay is less variable. Um, we mentioned it previously, but um, clearly the specs, uh, those, and this is a key slide, uh, the specs are linked to uh, the methods. Uh, you cannot be, uh, you need to account for the variability of the methods. They are linked also to the manufacturing process. It should account for the drug substance and drug product stability. They are linked to the clinical and tox data, and uh, they uh, should be justified by uh, statistical analysis. The um, acceptance criteria should be established and justified based on the data obtained from lot use in preclinical and or clinical data. And um, so if some a sponsor would like to propose to be outside of uh, the clinical or preclinical experience, uh, you can expect the regulators to, uh, to ask you to provide a strong uh, justification for that, and that could come from uh, any uh, toxicology studies or literature. Um, data from lots, the, the acceptance criteria should come from the lot used to demonstrate the manufacturing uh, consistency during uh, development, uh, from the stability studies and from uh, the development data. The expectation is not just to have acceptance criteria and specification for uh, the drug substance and the drug product, but uh, considering that uh, the, the, the materials, the raw materials are variable in nature, there should be uh, uh, controls uh, around those materials. Uh, same for the container closure system, there should be uh, specifications uh, uh, same for excipients, and, uh, and also acceptance criteria should be defined for uh, 
uh, the, the end of the product shelf life. So this is uh, the list of uh, different elements uh, that should be considered uh, that may be used to justify uh, the acceptance criteria or the specifications. Uh, we talked about the manufacturing process, uh, the lots used to demonstrate consistency, uh, the linkage, the preclinical and clinical uh, uh, batches. Uh, clearly, uh, we need a, there is a link with the clinical methods, and I will share like a, an example uh, at the end of my presentation about that. Uh, the um, should account for the IPC uh, in process control acceptance criteria ac uh, action limits. Uh, the account for the stability and degradation over time the selected impurities, degradation product, should use a carry all the characterization data and biological activity data, should take into account the reference standard material and the pharmacopial uh, monograph. Uh, that's exactly the same slide. We, uh, we, we use the same uh, <laughs> presentation. So this means that, uh, so when you develop or you set your specifications, you should start with the process capability. You, you, you can uh, manufacture within a quality range. And after that, you have, in order to develop your spec, you need to account for the stability loss over time and for the var assay variability. So overall, the spec is, see, even if that's your quality range, the the spec is really uh, b between the two uh, red lines. Uh, when it's time to set uh, the spec for the impurities, uh, you need to consider, uh, so do we know the safety profile of this impurity? Is it, so what's the toxic dose, dose the bioactivity? Um, what is the safety profile of the product with this impurity? I've, did they use a lot with a certain level of impurities in clinical phase one where we could extract some safety data? Uh, what's the impact of that impurity on the product quality and stability? For example, what we see as a regulator uh, is um, contamination with lipase and it degrades polysorbate, and you can see over time uh, a degradation. So you need to, um, if that's the case, polysorbate 80 must be uh, tightly controlled, and they need also uh, to, uh, to put control in place to limit uh, the concentration of uh, lipase uh, contamination. Uh, so another aspect in setting impurity specification is the manufacturing capability consistency. Uh, here we talk about clearance, uh, for example, HCP DNA. So if uh, you can demonstrate that uh, the purification process can remove those impurities at an acceptable level, uh, so there might be no need to set a spec at the drug release and drug product. And also the dose and route of administration uh, should be uh, considered uh, when you set the impurity uh, specifications. So um, we touched base uh, about this earlier, but you know the process and product related impurities, they should be characterized as far as possible when we talk uh, about impurities. You should look and try to determine the biological activity if you can. And the acceptance criteria uh, should be set according to the clinical batches and consistency run. Uh, as I was mentioning for H O cell proteins, DNA, uh, testing of either the drug substance or drug product may not be necessary if you have validation data to show that it's removed during uh, the process. And uh, sometimes uh, you have only limited data when uh, you file the marketing application to the regulators. So you might have to uh, uh, do verification at commercial scale. 
and uh, this may be uh, implemented after marketing authorization. This is the slide about uh, in process acceptance criteria and action limits. Uh, there, are, there are set in process tests are performed at critical decision making step and at other step where uh, the data serve to confirm consistency of the process uh, during the production at the drug substance or drug product uh, stage. Uh, the result of the IPC testing may be recorded at action limit or uh, reported as acceptance criteria. Uh, and performing such testing may eliminate the need for testing of the drug substance or drug product, and this was the example of HCP and DNA. And uh, so these limits, which are the responsibility of the manufacturer, may be used to initiate investigation or further action, and this is really useful. Uh, for the company, if you see a trend, something, and that, you know, even if you meet the lot, uh, the, the release spec, you notice uh, a trend at the IPC level, so you might decide to investigate, see uh, what's the root cause to avoid uh, a bigger problem later on. So those are some example of IPCs that we uh, commonly see in the manufacture of uh, biologics. Uh, here is another way to, uh, to present the specification life cycle. Uh, during the preclinical pre uh, studies, you have early development lots with a minimal uh, product characterizations. So, uh, the, the expectation from the regulatory agencies is that you establish uh, some safe, the safety spe specifications. When you move to the phase one, phase two, now you start to develop the pilot scale. You do more product characterization and you start to set pre preliminary uh, specification. When you move to the phase three trials, uh, the expectation is that you have the commercial scale in place. Uh, at that time, you should also uh, complete the full product characterizations and uh, based on several lots manufactured to date, uh, you can uh, set the stability uh, and release uh, specifications. And after, uh, after uh, post-approval changes, uh, comparability studies uh, can be uh, conducted and uh, with stability studies you get new information and based on this new product understanding, process understanding, you may uh, refine your uh, specifications. Uh, one aspect listed in Q6B is the pharma pharmacopial spec. We mentioned that in the previous talk. They're important uh, and uh, and they need to comply with it. Uh, it's part of the evaluation of either the drug substance or, or drug product. And they generally include, but are, they are not limited to the sterility testing and do toxin, microbial limits, volume and container, uniform, uniformity of dosage form, and uh, uh, particulate matters. And, and also, as you mentioned, that if the sponsor wants to uh, propose uh, alternate testing, they can do so as long as they have comparability data to show that the methods is equivalent or superior. And we see this, now we start seeing that with the sterility testing. It takes time, the, the, you know, 14, seven days, 14 days. Now some companies are proposing to have uh, sterility testing with a reduced time. So, uh, but they need data to demonstrate that uh, the method is as good as the pharmacopial one or superior. Specific the selection of tests when you define your spec uh, is product specific and uh, the rationale, and rationale here is, is also in bold because we like rationale, it's, it's everything should be justified uh, why you propose to use that test with this acceptable range, and what did you use to define that acceptable range? So it should come from data obtained from lot use in preclinical and clinical data. 
It should come from lot use to demonstrate the consistency and from the stability, stu from the stability studies uh, relevant development data. Um, there, there may be uh, circumstances in which routine testing of an attributes of the drug substance and drug product uh, can be substituted um, so uh, by upstream control in the manufacturing process. We were giving the example of HCP and DNA. Uh, so in that case, the, those tests will be considered in process acceptance criteria. Uh, in order to do that, it requires a sufficient understanding of sources of viability and their impact on downstream processes, in process materials, and drug substance, drug product quality. And this is important. Before shifting control upstream, applicants should determine that factors later in the process from the point of control will not compromise the effective control. And uh, so that may include a real-time release testing. Uh, the traditional and enhanced approach, and this is a consideration in developing uh, uh, the control strategy as per ICH Q11. Uh, the control strategy should ensure that each drug substance uh, quality control attributes uh, is within the appropriate range, limit, or distribution to assure drug substance quality. Uh, the drug substance spec is one part of the total control strategy and not all CQAs need to be included in the drug substance spec. CQAs can be included on the spec and confirmed through testing the f at the final drug substance stage. They can be included in the spec and confirmed through the upstream control, uh, like with real-time release testing, or not included on the spec but ensured through upstream controls, and this must be demonstrated. And for drug substances that, uh, that are particularly sensitive to factors such as temperature, change, oxidation, light, uh, ionic content, and shear, these factors should be considered before implementing upstream approach to attribute controls, and this is the case for most uh, biologics. And when in-process controls are used in lieu of testing, of spec drug substance attribute, these controls should be described and justified. So ICH Q11 is also uh, it's in line with Q6B. Uh, this is just a quick list uh, of the tests that should appear um, uh, and are applicable to all drug substance, appearance, description, identity testing. Uh, there should be one, more than one test, um, qu uh, purity, Impurity, potency, variance, uh, product, process rated variance, product rated variance, pH, bioburden, endotoxin, and other tests are product uh, dependent. And that list is for the drug product, which is uh, really uh, similar. So you have that list in Q6B. Uh, so we were saying that the spec should account for uh, the stability, degradation over time and stability. So, because it may be the case, uh, the level of impurities may increase during manufacture or storage of the product. Uh, and if impurities are known to be introduced or formed during the production and storage of the drug product and not the drug substance, the, the level of these impurities should be determined and acceptance criteria established at the drug product stage. And acceptance criteria and uh, test methods should be developed to measure changes in the drug substance during the manufacture and or storage of the drug product. And, uh, and you should have, considering the degradation, degradation profile, you should, uh, you, you can set release or shelf life lim limits. It's not mandatory, uh, but the, the concept is that the release limit uh, are normally tighter than the uh, shelf life limit to account for the degradation over time. So this was like a quick overview of Q6B, similar to uh, the previous speaker. And uh, so here are some um, experience I would like to share with you, uh, common issues that uh, we find when it's related to uh, specifications. Uh, the first example I, I gave 
is uh, about the protein uh, concentrations. You know, I, I'm a reviewer of monoclonal antibodies, and normally the, the limit is the target plus minus 10 percent. See, that's the that's the norm. I, I, of course, it depends on the therapeutic therapeutic window. It could be uh, uh, smaller than that, but it has to be justified. Uh, but this, when you see this, here you can see the like the last 23 lots, and they had 17 lots consecutively below the target. So what does it mean? This means that for 17 lots, so they, they, they didn't meet the label claim. Even if they were meeting the plus minus 10%, they were consistently below the label claim. And, and according to regulations, and it's a labeling requirement, that if you label your product at such a strength, uh, protein concentration, you, have, you should be able to at least overlap you know, the mean so not to be always uh, under. So in this case, it could be like um, uh, a problem related to uh, the process. And uh, this was something that we uh, informed the sponsor and they had to put uh, investigate on this and, uh, and put uh, corrective action uh, in place. Another uh, example about the potency assay, what we see, um, it's mainly for cancer because uh, for antibodies treated against cancer, uh, several mechanisms of actions uh, may be uh, part of the full uh, efficacy of the product. Uh, you, you may have uh, HCC, you may have CDC, uh, so the contribution of each mechanism of action should be evaluated as part of the main activity of the drug. Uh, it might be like CDC accounts for 70% of the efficacy, uh, ADCC 30%. Uh, you know, at least it should, they should all be uh, assessed. And uh, surrogate marker may be used when potency assay are too complicated or highly variable. And we see this, ADCC, we know it's really highly variable. Uh, so you can look at the total of causation in lieu of ADCC, but you need data to support, uh, to justify the correlation and, and literature for the, to support the correlation and data to support the acceptance criteria. Uh, and for the ID identity testing, what we see is sometimes the assay is not specific enough because companies that manufacture monoclonal antibodies, they don't, normally they don't manufacture any one. They have like several products. And so they should be able to discriminate the drug among all other drugs manufactured at the, at the same site. And also in terms of acceptance criteria for the identity testing, it should be more detailed than comparable to referral, referral standard. Uh, we like to see uh, if you use a peptide mapping, you provide the description of, let's say, the, the, the contain the five major peaks. Uh, for purity testing, you know, we always encourage companies to use start-of-the-art methods. Uh, and, and, you know, in 2019, uh, SDS page is not considered start-of-the-art uh, methods. Um, so replacement of the method post-approval by more specific and accurate method is encouraged. And now we see, we see this, you know, uh, we approve a marketing application with HPLC, and now they develop the new HPLC method. It's more accurate. Uh, lower limit of uh, quant quantitations. And, and this is something that we see frequently and uh, it's the method should be able to support their intended purpose. In this example, that's an example that we, uh, I, I, I did receive a marketing application with this. So the company was proposing uh, f an acceptance criteria of not more than 2% for uh, 
for the, uh, for the aggregates uh, by size exclusion HPLC. But when we were looking at the validation, the method validation data, so the limit of quantitation was only 5%. Was five, so they were not able to, uh, to, to quantitate up to uh, 2%. So uh, you should ensure that the method that you propose support uh, the, 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 the acceptance criteria. In terms of uh, process related uh, impurities, so first it's to make sure that uh, the, the removal of those impurities are supported by uh, clearance data. And here I put some antifoam and uh, agents, antibiotics. So, you know, the commonly seen uh, process related impurities, normally companies, they have clearance data, but sometimes uh, it's a new product uh, we don't know about it. We, we see that it's a toxic product at certain levels. They don't talk about it, so we need to ask for that. So make sure that all those small molecules that may be toxic that you had uh, in the cell culture medium, that they are removed uh, uh, adequately. Otherwise, there should be um, uh, acceptance limit for that. And so the acceptance criteria should be supported by tox data and or pharmacopoeia and monograph. And here we listed some uh, typical uh, acceptance criteria for endotoxin, bioburden, DNA, and uh, subvisible particles. But the main point here is that each limit should be uh, properly justified. Um, in terms of product rated variants, uh, as we mentioned during the presentation, they should be characterized. Activity should be determined, and 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 they should be tightly controlled when the variants are hyperpot. And I've seen, I've seen that like a product-rated variant, which was 1,000 times more potent than the desired product. So in that case, you know, it's really important. They need to to control. But more than that, also maybe they might. Uh, try to make a process change to see why they get that at that level of product hyperpotent level of impurity. So, but that's something to, to keep in mind as a regulator when you see this. There may be a safety aspect to that, and a, a big effic efficacy and safety aspect to that. Um, Polysorbate 80. Uh, Sometimes it's used as an excipient. And um, so the sponsor, they, they formulate the drug substance, they add the drug substance uh, at the drug substance stage, then they move to the drug product, they do uh, filtrations, and they fill in the, the vial or in the peripheral syringe. So, but the, the, the polysorbate 80 is not tested at drug product. So, they need to demonstrate that the filtration step at the drug product level uh, doesn't impact the concentration of polysorbate because that may impact the stability of the product. And this is something that we see also frequently. So if polysorbate is an important excipient, if it's added at the drug substance stage, you, you uh, need to add a test for polysorbate 80 as part of the drug product spec or you need to demonstrate that the filtration step does not impact the concentration. And uh, last example uh, I have is, um, is for protein concentration when uh, they are performed at multiple testing sites. For example, they use, the company use one site for release and they use a different site for stability testing but they didn't perform interlab validation studies. So, um, so they run their protein concentration assays and, and, dif and, we and we found out that different SOPs were used at each site for sample preparation. So, uh, so the result is that they were getting a different concentration for the same sample. So, uh, and uh, with this, it's really hard to uh, meet the label claims or to avoid any drifting. 
if you cannot rely you know, on your SOPs. So when multiple testing sites are used, either at release stability or for release, make sure to uh, have interlab validation data to show that uh, the assay at one site will perform as well at the other site. And uh, this last slide uh, are the key points that uh, I suggest that uh, companies may want to discuss with the regul regulatory agencies and when they come for uh, the pre-submission meetings. Um, you can discuss uh, appropriate characterization and batch release assays for glycoproteins. Uh, you may discuss your process clearance data in lieu of batch release testing for all cell protein, DNA, uh, the role of characterization versus the spec that you propose for variant form of a proteins. Uh, what level of characterization should they expect to, uh, to have at the IND stage? Um, and uh, what kind, you can always propose the spec that you plan for the initial marketing authorizations and also you can um, uh, discuss your in-house control limits versus regulatory uh, specifications. This uh, cartoon is just to show that, you know, the specs, they're est established to ensure that, you know, everything will work well. You have a product, everything, it's clear. It says, if you want to buy it, the man, this is the good area you should you should buy it. Don't try the boot, it's not good. And this slide is that something went wrong because you know there are always exceptions like when in a drug manufacturing process you may discover uh, different variants and uh, that uh, you need to uh, monitor. So, so this is just to say that uh, we encourage other companies to um, to ad adapt and uh, revise their specification after approval uh, in order to ensure the product will be, will cover all new impurities or variants that may be produced. And those are acknowledgements and I can take questions. Yeah,질문이없으시면질문해주시죠예 한국말로 해도 되, 되는 거죠? 예. 네. 어, 좋은 발표 감사합니다. 저는 어, 시각처 오일용 어, 연구관입니다. 아, 제가 드리고 싶은 질문은 아, 라이페이지에 관한 질문인데요. 그 RCH Q6 비에서도 라이페이지로 인해서 미치는 영향에 대해서 고려를 해야 된다고 했었고, 그리고 발표하신 슬라이드 사례 중에서 아, 폴리솔베이트 80 같은 것을 사용할 때 어, 주의를 좀 해야 된다고 말씀하셨는데 어, 기본적으로 알기에 초셀에서 내재적으로 발현하는 라이페이지 때문에 아마 엑스피션트로 사용하는 어, 폴리솔베이트나 어, 트윈이 분해돼서 문제를 일으키는 경우가 생긴 걸 알고 있습니다. 혹시 헬스 캐나다에서 이런 경험이 있는지 그리고 해결할 제시 아, 해결 방안을 어떻게 제시하셨는지 궁금합니다. 보통 해결 방안은 뭐 필트레이션을 좀더 강화한다든가 아니면 초셀의 라이페이지를 나가우시켜서 그 초셀을 개발한다든가라는 방법들이 있을 것으로 알고 있는데 어떠한 형식으로 어그 문제 해결에 대한 솔루션을 제시하셨는지 경험 있으시면 말씀해 주시면 감사하겠습니다. Thank you very much for the question. Um, so, how we handle that, see, um, I don't have solutions. It's uh, companies, they, they need to develop and find solutions. Um, so what we propose is 
we know it's a critical aspect. We see uh, in the something happened in the stability studies. We started to see degradation of that excipient. So and so we asked them to uh, tightly control because before there was no spec. Uh, it was it was not controlled during the stability studies. Now we we ask them to control it. Um, so maybe a change to polysorbate 20. So I don't know. So they just need to uh, propose something in order to uh, tr maybe uh, purify, try to remove the lipase. Uh, but uh, if they cannot remove it, as so at the end, with the data we have from the stability studies, we may reduce the shelf life, you know, on, uh, up to uh, the point where uh, all uh, the CQAs will meet uh, the spec. So, um, so, and we started to see that, and uh, but that's how we ended that. So, the, the, the we don't have a solution to propose to uh, the companies. They really have to try to either use another XCPN or they need to control tightly uh, over uh, the stability studies their polysorbate 80 concentrations, and at the end, if, uh, if the concentration goes below the acceptance limit for polysorbate, we'll just reduce the shelf life.슬라이드 마지막 부분에 멀티플 테스팅 사이트에 대해서 언급을 하셨는데 그 멀티플 테스팅 사이트를 어쩔 수 없이 유지를 해야 되는 경우가 종종 생기게 되는데 그때에 어떻게 관리를 하는 게그 헬스 캐나다의 레코멘데이션인지 궁금합니다. Yeah. Um, yeah, thank you for that uh, questions. Um, so in that case that I, I presented is that we noticed that uh, I understand it's really hard for the companies that have several uh, multiple sites, uh, testing sites. So uh, they use different SOPs for the sample preparations and that created like, you know, a change. So, uh, uh, so I will advise that when you implement a, uh, a new testing site, uh, when you do your tech transfer, uh, you make sure that the SOPs are the same. I understand that sometimes the, the equipments might not be identical, uh, similar, but like in terms of sample preparation, you should, should try, you know, to minimize any differences. So, so that's, the, that's, that, that's the only way. And because like in that case, they never did site A, site B, but they never did the interlab validation data. So at least if you can do the interlab validation data with the same sample, you do the testing, you determine the protein concentration, and if you see that, you know, it's, it's, it's statistically speaking, it's within the acceptable range, uh, you know, you're, you're okay. If not, this means there is something that, you know, make, a, make the difference. Thank you.